Okay, um, for the, the audience to engage um, with the, the speakers in the session and to ask questions, um, there are two ways that we've provided for you all to do this. Of course, if you're here in person, we ask that you raise the ha your hand and we'll get the mic to you so that everyone can hear your question. Um, but if you're attending online, you also have the opportunity to submit a question via the YouTube chat functionality. Um, and we'll increasingly, as, as time goes on and we get more accustomed to the Menti technology, we'll be using this um, in the actual talks to provide opportunity for audience feedback. Um, but we'll, we'll have some, some questions via Menti. You can go to Menti on your, your cell phone um, if you have internet access. And um, today we have another opportunity for that engagement. And this is really uh, driven by the communications group, which is always interested in the types of ways that um, we use social media channels. So um, maybe as a brief test, we'll ask you to vote in this poll. Um, the code that you enter when you go to menti.com is 83 um, 3823, and uh, we'll open it now and ask you which of the following social media channels you use to share and connect on research. So we'll have this open for about 30 seconds, and we'll see what the results are. So maybe it sounds like we're we're missing an option. Okay, none of the above. All right. Well, so we have some work to do, um, but it looks like uh, LinkedIn is a, a primary. That's surprising, Carolyn. What do you what do you think? Is that? I would have gone with Twitter. But yes, Twitter. Okay. Um, so so this is good to know. So um, we do have a DCRI Twitter feed that. Um, offers links to research forum archives, um, archive talks, and um, if you're interested in future sessions that we have or what's going on that week, it's a good uh, resource. Okay, um, so without further ado, I'll introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Bernard Gersh, who is professor um, of medicine at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Gersh has a really interesting background, was born in Johannesburg and then um, Grew up in Zambia and uh, returned to South Africa, went to the University of Cape Town for his medical training, and then um, the University of Oxford for his Doctor of Philosophy, where he was also a Rhodes Scholar. Um, he is widely published, has over um, 1,100 publications, I believe, and actually that was as of a few weeks ago, so at, at his rate, I think it's probably about 12, 1250 by now. Um, he uh, has been the editor of 15 book chapters and the recipient of um, numerous awards, including the James B. Herrick Award from the American Heart Association and is the mas a master of the American College of Cardiology. Um, and from 2002 to 2012, was on the Reuters list of uh, scientists with the greatest number of cited scientific publications um, and has a, an astonishing, astonishingly high H index, which um, when I last checked, was higher than Chris Granger's, which is uh, quite the accomplishment. So um, yeah, but uh, Chris, if you age adjust, I think is now ahead. <laughs> um, Dr. Granger, if you're listening, um, send me an email, and we can get get the truth on this. Um, <laughs> so uh, please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Dr. Gersh. Thank you. So. Uh, Chris has said that he won't include me on any of his papers because he wants to keep my H index where it is. So I'm going to talk about risk stratification for stroke, uh, a critique. And um, what I'd like to just do in the first four or five slides is summarize the work we've done and, and, and my concept of atrial fibrillation. And that, I think, will place into perspective the various risk factors. This, uh, from a diagram published in Circulation, really does illustrate, I think, um, how, how does this, oh, sorry. Really does illustrate, um, I, I think, the concept. And I think of atrial fibrillation is not one disease, but really two diseases. And on the left, here to the left of the spectrum, is low in atrial fibrillation, a triggered disease, an arrhythmia, probably due to pulmonary vein potentials. There's a genetic background. There's increased vagal tone may play a role. And these are the patients who do, uh, tend to be paroxysmal, and they do very well with, uh, with ablation. To the right is the majority of patients. 
uh, that we see where you have a trigger, which may be pulmonary vein potentials or atrial extracystalis, but they also have a disease substrate. And the disease substrate is modified by age or the result of age, obesity plays a role, and atherosclerotic risk factors. And I really think that in these people, atrial fibrillation is a vascular disease. And that's really been the thrust of a lot of our work over the last uh, 20 years. And if you look at the um, suggestive evidence, it's this, that obesity, at least in the original hypothesis, which I think we've gone on to, to document, obesity, hypertension, the metabolic syndrome, sleep apnea, among other factors, cause atrial fibrillation. We have also shown in a whole series of studies that um, diastolic dysfunction and increased left atrial volume are strongly associated with atrial fibrillation. I don't think there's any doubt about it at all. Subsequent studies from, again, uh, our echo lab and elsewhere showed a strong correlation between diastolic dysfunction, LA volume, and increased arterial stiffness with all of these conditions. The only reason I put a question mark here with sleep apnea, we've shown an association with sleep apnea, but it's very difficult when people with sleep apnea to tease out the comorbidities, namely hypertension, obesity, and so on. So you don't, what you really need to do for us to be able to say uh, that all three of these correlate or are associated with sleep apnea would be to take a sleep apnea patient without comorbidities, and there are not many of them. The only question is, what are, what are the causal factors? I, I think that, um, sorry, let me go back. This link is very clear cut. This link is very clear cut. There's no question that these links are very clear cut. But the factors that may modify this are multiple. Neurohormonal, uh, angiotensin 2, TGF beta 2, and, and beta 1, tissue factors, vascular and hemostatic factors, particularly endothelin-1, oxidative stress and inflammation, and galactin. And the question here is, are these causes or are they surrogates? And this is a whole series of work that is ongoing. I think if you look at the met this study, it also makes an important point. This is from a meta-analysis of the placebo arm of the five random <coughs> randomized trials that compared warfarin um, with placebo in stroke um, patients with atrial fibrillation. The placebo stroke rate was 4.5% per year, and these were the risk factors in this meta-analysis. Prior stroke, history of hypertension, advanced age, diabetes, history of heart failure. Does that sound kind of familiar, Chad's, Chad's too? But what really interested me was all of these were age-related, and there's no question that Age in itself is a very powerful risk factor for stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. But then we'd previously published in the New England Journal uh, this paper on patients with low atrial fibrillation. These were people under the age of 60. They had no risk factors. Their stroke rate over 15 and subsequently 25-year follow-up, uh, which we recently published, was less than 1% per year. But they have the same arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation. And so the question is, um, is it the arrhythmia or is it the company it keeps? And I think there are two, uh, uh, what I'm going to show in this diagram, are two clear pathways to associate atrial fibrillation and stroke. And it may place again into perspective the risk factors or the risk factor scores. Atrial fibrillation by reducing left atrial appendage, flow velocity, uh, stasis in the chamber, dilatation, thrombus formation, and in this model, AF precedes stroke. Uh, elimination of atrial fibrillation may prevent stroke, and left atrial appendage closure may prevent stroke, uh, assuming that the clots are all in the appendage and not in the left atrium, may prevent stroke. The other uh, explanation is this. Age, atherosclerotic risk factors, perhaps genetics, comorbid diseases like sleep apnea, all cause vascular inflammation and injury and fibrosis. This in turn leads to diastolic dysfunction and an atrial myopathy. Sorry about the typo there, which may be primary or secondary. <clears throat> As a result of that, you get atrial dilatation, fibrosis, endothelial dysfunction, 
and all of this can affect the endothelium of the atrium and the appendage, causing thrombus formation. The other mechanism would be that endothelial dysfunction in itself can result in a hypercoagulable state, and that in turn can cause left atrial thrombus. And uh, in this model, the mechanical dysfunction of the atrium and the electrical heterogeneity uh, may be a marker of the vascular disease burden. And so in this situation, perhaps attacking the left atrial appendage may not solve the problem. And uh, it's very relevant to the risk factors that I'm going to show you for stroke as to whether or not you're dealing with this sort of problem as opposed to a vascular problem, which I think is the problem in the majority. Now, if you look at the, this... Um, graph of the performance of contemporary risk stratification schemes, you see the problem. They vary enormously in their ability to identify patients at low, intermediate, and high risk. Shown here, Birmingham 2009, this was actually the CHADS VAS score. But this is what I want to emphasize. Look at the C statistic. It's really pretty poor. It ranges from 0.549 to 0.638. So none of these risk scores have a very good C statistic, not at all. And uh, recently, I uh, did talk to Chris Granger yesterday, they published the ABC score, which uh, came out of um, the Aristotle trial. And the ABC score uh, uses troponin, B and P, and age, and I think prior stroke. And uh, the paper says this really resulted in a marked improvement in the C statistic, what it went from 0.6 to 0.65. So it went from pretty lousy to not so lousy, you know. And uh, this, this is the problem. I mean, uh, C statistic, as you know, of 0.5 is equivalent to flipping a coin heads or tails. The other point to be made is this. This is a small case control study we did looking at the CHAD score and left atrial thrombi and atrial fibrillation. Small study, 110 patients, non-valvular atrial fib, left atrial appendage thrombus, transesophageal echo, Cases were the patients with thrombus in the left atrium, controls did not. And if you look at the distribution of scores, yes, if you look at those with higher scores shown here in orange, these are cases. Um, more cases than controls had higher CHAD scores, but the real message is there's tremendous overlap. And so CHAD scores do not reflect left atrial thrombus. That's not what they measure. They measure risk and vascular risk. Now, look at the AFib guidelines. Um, in fact, they, they've just been modified, and I think the ESC really got this right, um, uh, particularly in terms of CHADS VASC 1 and CHADS VASC 2. What they originally, the, the guidelines basically recommended, the ESC guidelines, anticoagulation with everybody with a CHADS VASC of one or more, with the exception of female alone, which is not considered a risk factor. I think that rightly, the ESC modified that conclusion. And they gave Chad's VASC of 1, took it from a 1 down to a 2A. Chad's VASC 2, as everybody agrees, is a class 1 indication for anticoagulation. The US ACC AHA guidelines infuriate me, because for reasons that I still can't understand, and I've tried to find out, they still include aspirin. And there, that's another topic, I think, which we've discussed before. There's absolutely no role for aspirin in stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. And I like the options here. Uh, you can either do nothing or give oral anticoagulants or give aspirin. You know, it's like being a little bit pregnant, just a tiny bit. And there's no role for aspirin. There's absolutely no role. If anybody is interested, I'll give you the reference to an editorial we recently wrote on the topic in European Heart. Now, I think the Chad's VAS score is very useful in defining low risk. This is from the Danish registry. So if you have a Chad's 2 score of zero, just focus on the one-year follow-up. If you have a Chad's 2 score of zero and a Chad's VAS score of zero, you're really at very, very low risk. If your Chad's 2 is zero and your Chad's VASC is one, the risk has increased in terms of the odds ratio. But if you have a Chad's VASC score of 1, and you have a, Ch a CHADS 2 score of 1, a CHADS VAS score of 1, 
then your risk is low. But if you have a CHADS 2 score of 1 and you've got a CHADS VAS score of 2, the risk is substantially increased. So I think the major, and I'll come back to this in my very last slide, the major advantage of the CHADS VAS score is it's extremely good, I think, at identifying people at really a low risk with a CHADS VAS score of 0 or 1. But you know, what do these scores measure? They measure vascular disease, hypertension, age, diabetes, um, prior stroke, congestive heart failure, and the VASC is a vascular disease. Now, this is um, a complex review published in circulation recently of 34 eligible cohort studies uh, published by um, Quinn and Dan Singer from the Mass General. And what they really showed is the tremendous heterogeneity of stroke rates in these studies, ranging from 0.45 to 9.25 percent per year. And if you look at the ischemic stroke rates and the chads vas score, it tells quite a story. If you have a chads vas score of 1, 76 percent of patients will have a stroke rate of less than 1% per year. But 18% will have a higher stroke rate. If you take a chads vas score of 2, 27% will still have a stroke rate of less than 1% per year, but 73% will have a higher stroke rate. So the conclusions were that the majority of cohorts did not observe stroke rates that would indicate a clear expected net clinical benefit for anticoagulation of patients with CHADS VAS scores of 1 or 2. Well, I'm not sure I agree with that statement. And the reason is this. I think that if you have an 18% chance of having a stroke rate of greater than 2% per year, that would justify anticoagulation. And if you have a CHADS VAS score of 2, you've got a 78% chance, at least in all of these cohort studies put together, of having a stroke rate of at least 2% per year. Now, the conventional wisdom is that I think it, for warfarin to be effective, you need to have a stroke rate of about 1.9% per year. This is in a decision analysis. For a NOAC to be effective, your stroke rate needs to be somewhere around 1% per year or 0.9% per year. So I think whether or not you're going to use a CHADS VASC of 1 may depend on what is the underlying stroke rate in the population. And you live here in the stroke belt. Um, but in general, in the US, the stroke rate is much less than it is in Europe. And most of the guidelines are driven by stroke rates in countries like Denmark, which are probably somewhere in the range of 2% per year. Now, this um, uh, Swedish study, and, and let me emphasize again, there's a difference between the stroke rates in Sweden and Denmark in the two registries. But in this study, in a rather nice analysis, they looked at TIAs in yellow, pulmonary embolism in orange, uh, unspecified stroke or systemic embolism in green, and ischemic stroke only. And if you really just uh, blow this up, the tipping point was 1.7% per year with warfarin and 0.9% with the NOAC. And by the tipping point, I mean the point at which the risk versus the benefit. The benefit outweighs the risk. And so it's um, uh, in, in this population, a CHADS VAS score of 1 didn't reach the, chipping, the, the tipping point. A CHADS VAS score of 1 was, well, it was still well under 1% per year. So yes, if your stroke rate is 2% um, per year, then a CHADS VAS of 1 may be a powerful predictor or, or useful, but not if it's lower than that. And this is from a study, it's not in press, we've published this now, and it, my colleague Peter Noseworthy, who some of you know, uh, Jonathan, um, working with the Optum database, this was about 65,000 patients. And there were a couple of things that uh, came out of the study that I really, I found pretty disturbing. First of all, if we looked at adherence, that is defined by more than 80 days prescriptions uh, covered by oral anticoagulants, 43% of people were not adherent. They were not filling their prescriptions. And I didn't believe this figure when I saw it. Now I've seen it from two other studies. Fascinating, isn't it? We have three drugs at work in the world. 
uh, oral anticoagulants, antihypertensives, and statins, and people just don't take them. But what we also found in this study is, let me take you through it, this is the cumulative time off oral anticoagulants uh, using the references less than one week. So in yellow was you were, you were off oral anticoagulants for a week to a month, orange one to three months, green three to six months, and blue greater than six months. And then this is the rate of stroke with systemic embolism. It's really interesting. If you have a Chads Vasco of 0 or 1 in the United States and you don't take your oral anticoagulant, we saw no increase in stroke. If you look at the blue line, even in people who were off the drug for more than six months, we saw no increase in stroke whatsoever. All we did see was a reduction in bleeding, actually. But if the Chads Vasco was 2 or above, there was this clear increased hazard ratio for stroke, 2.7 and 3.4 hazard ratio. So at least in this population in the US, I agree with the ESC guidelines that a Chads Vasco of 1 is optional. It's for discussion. A Chads Vasco of 2, we will all agree, should be anticoagulated. Now the other problem is this, that the risk factors for thromboembolic events in atrial fibrillation patients um, vary with the particular variable that goes into the Chads VASC score. And if you look at Chads VASC scoring of one, one point, um, two points is prior stroke, we know that, age greater than 75 years is two points. But if you just look at the one pointers and the size of the, 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 the weight of it is shown by the size of the circle, uh, age is a much more powerful risk factor than female gender or vascular disease or hypertension or diabetes. So it's, the Chad's VASC has many components and some of the components carry a lot more weight than others. And that's taken into account, I must say, in the Canadian guidelines. They, they really are quite good. Uh, if age is greater than 65, that's a powerful component of the Chad's VASC score, oral anticoagulants. Prior stroke, hypertension, heart failure, and diabetes, yes, oral anticoagulants. But uh, they take out coronary disease or arterial vascular disease, and those patients, they do not recommend oral anticoagulants, but aspirin. But not for stroke prevention. Aspirin for secondary prevention of vascular disease, not for stroke prevention. And obviously, if they don't have any of that, no antithrombotic. And uh, they make a statement about considering all the risk factors and, and their individual weights. Now, this is a, a study that points out the CHADS 2 score uh, predicts ischemic stroke or TIAs uh, in patients with sinus rhythm. So this is in the absence of atrial fibrillation. Now, is that a surprise? Of course not. Hypertension, age, diabetes, I mean, come on. Uh, this is an interesting study. The impact of risk scores on long-term outcomes of AF fibrillation. So if you look at um, recurrent atrial fibrillation with the CHADS of 0 to 1, 2 to 4, and greater than 5, or if you look at a CHADS VAS score of 0 to 1, 2 to 4, and greater than 5, it, <coughs> it predicts recurrent atrial fibrillation after ablation. Why? I'm, I'm sure it's, ref it's reflective of what I said right in the beginning, that uh, people, the majority of people with atrial fibrillation have a vascular disease that probably results in endothelial dysfunction, um, atrial fibrosis, although we haven't been able to measure it with MRI. Others have, but we haven't. We've tried. But in any event, I think these are the people that have a disease substrate. They have persistent atrial fibrillation, and the results of ablation uh, are not as good. And it's reflecting the vascular disease. Now, uh, Emily's going to hate this slide, but um, this is now not in press. It's also been published. Uh, stratification of bleeding risk. So what we looked at in this study, again from Optum, is the, the bleeding scores, has bled and orbit, which was published by Emily, the atria bleeding score. But we also looked at Chad's VASC and Chad's 2 as a predictor of bleeding. Not of stroke, but of bleeding. And what do you see? See statistics, both for major bleeding and intracranial bleeding are almost identical. So I don't think you need a bleeding score. I think you just need to 
you know, the Chad's too, or the Chad's VASC is common sense. And if you're at greater risk for stroke, you're at greater risk for bleeding. But that doesn't mean you should not be on anticoagulants. All the more reason to be on anticoagulants. Well, I, I've been using this slide all my life. I love it. Just when I knew all of life's answers, they changed all the questions. And that's the Aristotle data that Chris Granger and myself worked with Lars Valentin and Hijazi. And this, this is an amazing study. 13,000 patients in Aristotle uh, outcomes stratified by Chad's VASC and high sensitivity troponin. And if you just focus on the right of the graph here, Chad's VASC score of less than one and the highest quartile of troponin. Uh, huge, huge impact. Uh, that's on stroke and systemic embolism. But then if you look at cardiac death with a Chad's VASC score of less than one and you add on to that troponin, there's a marked uh, increase in event rates. And I'll come on to the explanation for this in the next slide. But very striking. Now, what does it mean, though? What actually does this mean? You know, uh, troponins are a marker of myocyte uh, stress, either apoptosis or perhaps necrosis. Uh, conditions that cause that are aging, tissue vulnerability, comorbidities, increased heart rates per se, ischemia, myocardial dysfunction and remodeling. And uh, possible contributory mechanisms, inflammation, fibrosis, a hypercoagulable state, endothelial dysfunction, increased myocyte turnover. What, I mean, what does this have to do with the left atrial appendage and thrombus in the LA appendage? And I don't think we really understand this, but something about these troponin elevations uh, are telling us something about the genesis, I think, of atrial fibrillation and stroke. And I think, again, they probably are reflective of the underlying vascular disease. And then the other biomarker was BNP, very striking. I think this I can explain because it may be a marker of atrial size, atrial stress, and so on. But Chad's VAS score and quartiles of BNP, and in, for each Chad's VAS score, and elevated um, the upper quartile of BNP markedly increases stroke risk. And in fact, it's um, highly predictive of stroke risk. So let's uh, wrap this up. What about the potential role of biomarkers? What, what is it that we're looking at with these biomarkers? Well, atrial fibrillation, as I pointed out, may be a risk factor for dilatation and fibrosis of the left atrium, um, thrombus in the left atrial appendage, uh, but the opposite may also be occur, and that is that dilatation and fibrosis as the result of vascular disease may in turn predispose to thrombus formation. Stasis, reduced left atrial and left atrial appendage velocity, and stroke risk is, is increased, and we understand that. Hypertension, very powerful risk factor. I think we can explain that. Hypertension causes LVH, increased LV wall stress, diastolic dysfunction, and maybe fibrosis. Diastolic dysfunction, in turn, increases atrial dilatation, and fibrosis goes on to atrial fibrillation. And in fact, in our Olmsted County study, we took people over age 65, and depending upon the atrial volume, we could stratify those with a 20% risk of atrial fibrillation versus a 1% risk of atrial fibrillation. And then there's this other group out here, where atrial fibrillation may not be a risk factor, but it's a marker or a surrogate of reduced compliance, aortic atherosclerosis, vascular disease. And in fact, in that setting, uh, the arterial stiffness may lead to the dilatation and fibrosis. And atrial fibrillation is a marker of the underlying vascular state. And then in all of these, where does inflammation fit in? It, somewhere. Don't think we know. But if you look at studies uh, that look at CRP and other markers of inflammation, it, it is out there somewhere, plays some role. So what about the biomarkers? And then there's, if you just stretch a left atrium, just like a saphenous vein, if you stretch the left atrium, you will get um, uh, a throm thrombogenic state. So if you look at the biomarkers, troponins, BNP, von Willebrand factor, D-dimer, all of which we've looked at in, in Aristotle, uh, BNP, IL-6, CRP, D-dimer again, CRP, 
E um, cisstatin and estimated GFR. I, I, th I think one can understand using this diagram what these biomarkers may be indicating. Quite how they uh, predict stroke uh, is not clear, but I think that the biomarkers are um, certainly elevated biomarkers can occur in many aspects of this pathophysiological process. So the future prospects of the biomarkers, will they predict treatment responses? Maybe. Uh, will they refine bleeding and stroke risk? Some people think yes, I'm not so sure, as I'll show you in my last slide. Genetic markers for tailoring of warfarin dosage, I don't think that's going to go very far. There have been some studies, it hasn't been very impressive. There's been statistical significance, but I'm not sure clinical relevance. Um, I think really what we're going to find out with the biomarkers is we'll, so much more that we'll understand about the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation. Uh, perhaps they will allow early disease detection and identify drug markets, but I think the biomarkers are very interesting in the atrial fibrillation stroke story, but do they really play a role at the moment in our evaluation of patients? And I don't think so. The other point I'd just like to make in my second last slide is that the CHAD score does not include many of these uh, factors that uh, may play a role in stroke risk and atrial fibrillation. Sleep apnea, renal dysfunction, I know you've looked at that in the ROCKET trial, I believe. I think uh, Ken Mahaffey may have looked at that. Imaging findings, what will we get by doing CT morphology of the left atrial appendage? Oh, and what about fibrosis? of the left atrial appendage or fibrosis of the left atrium. Um, I have to tell you that I, I, there's been a lot of work on this in Utah. We can't, we can't reproduce it, but we have not used their software yet, so we'll have to see. Smoking is not in this, uh, any of the risk scores. And then what about uh, you know, other diseases? Like if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a great interest of mine, you don't need a CHAD score. If you have atrial fibrillation, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you need oral anticoagulants, no risk score. So these are the limitations. I think that uh, the atrial fibrillation population is extremely heterogeneous regarding stroke risk. Uh, different classifications in measuring stroke rates may lead to overestimates. If you're going to include a TIA, you'll get a very different number than if you include ischemic stroke. Uh, current risk stratification schema are based primarily on clinical risk factors. The differential weight of individual risk factors needs to be taken into account. And the performance of a particular risk score will depend upon the underlying stroke rate in the population, whether you use a CHAS-VASC of 1 or 0. And what will be the role of biomarkers or imaging? So it's really a balance. On one hand, you've got simplicity and practicality. CHADS gives you that. It's simple, it's easy, it's practical. And, you know, at the other end is, is, is the question about the predictive accuracy of, of a score in terms of the risk versus benefit for oral anticoagulation. All you want to know, all one wants to know is, is it worth subjecting this patient to the risk of bleeding because to reduce growth? And that's really all a risk score needs to tell us. So the question is, how much incremental benefit are we going to get from biomarkers imaging complex weighted formulas? Uh, are we really going to get uh, a marked increase in the predictive ability and the clinical utility of a risk score? And I don't think the ABC score, for instance, has really done that, even though there's a big jump up in, a reasonable jump up in C statistic. And so the other approach, which I've, I've sort of coming to, is just be pragmatic. And that is identify the low-risk patients with a CHADS VASC of 0 or maybe 0 and 1 and anticoagulate the rest and then go on and do something else with our time. <laughs> so and I, as I think of this, I mean, I've, I really am fascinated by the biomarker data. I think it's terrific. I mean, I, and I think it's going to be a very ripe field of investigation in the next five years. But I'm not sure what the clinical utility will be. I think we'll learn a lot. But this is probably my approach for the moment, and that is just identify the low-risk people and then anticoagulate the rest.
So why don't I just stop there at that point? Move to the moderated discussion portion of our talk with Dr. John Pacini, who's an electrophysiologist here at the DCRI. Great. Uh, so I think I'm mic'd up. So, I'm, uh, so thank you, Dr. Gersh. As always, I've learned a ton uh, during your lecture, and it's Mayo Clinic Week here at the DCRI because your colleagues, Dr. Noseworthy and Dr. Packer, are going to be joining us on Friday oh, for really? a Cabana meeting. So, right. um, it's a good week here. So, um, you know, I. I think a lot of people have learned from you um, and, and truly believe that atrial fibrillation is in many ways an end organ electrical complication of vascular disease that manifests in the left atrium. And at ESC, uh, we saw now the second clinical trial where catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation in very sick patients yeah. appears to uh, accrue substantial benefit. Yeah. So there's probably some patients where you know rendering them back in sinus rhythm has considerable benefit. How do you how do we improve our knowledge of who's going to benefit, and how do we recognize that uh, reconcile that with our vascular disease hypothesis? Yeah, it's it it, it is a good question. Um, the trial was very impressive. This is, I think, the Castle AF trial, and uh, interestingly enough, um, John Cam chaired that DSMB, and I now realize what he was talking about two years ago. He came to me at an ESC meeting in Davos and said, listen, um, I'm, I'm, I'm working with a trial and there's a big mortality benefit in people with heart failure. And he said, you know, I really am worried. I, I wonder whether we should stop the trial. And it turns out that that benefit, again, was very early on and the magnitude declined over time. So they finished the trial. But your point is well taken and we'll have to see the the data from Cabana, and that is, um, I think everybody deserves a crack at sinus rhythm. Um, and I think, I, I do that. I mean, I'm, most of the patients I see, unless they're truly asymptomatic, I'll offer them a cardioversion and, and, and also to try and assess the symptomatic improvement. And you know, some people who think they're getting on fine will come to you in sinus rhythm afterwards and say, oh, I feel much better. Uh, with heart failure, I think, this trial, it's, do you remember how many patients were in it? Yeah, so I think between attack and castle, I think it's around 300 to 400 when yeah. you combine the two. I so so we are dealing with small trials. But I mean, I think it is a game changer. I mean, in people with, with, with heart failure, there was a clear improvement in mortality. And I was surprised by it. I've looked at our own Mayo data in people with... Um, systolic and diastolic dysfunction, if I can use the term. Uh, and what we found is that at least um, what we looked at, your young mate Charm, one of my colleagues, was if we restored sinus rhythm with a uh, successful ablation, there was a clear improvement in LV ejection fraction. Clearly. Uh, the downside was the recurrence rates were very high. So this trial had a fairly short follow-up, and I think I'd have to look up our paper, but if you go back, uh, if you went out to five years, I think the recurrence rate was about 60 to 70% if they started off with LV systolic or diastolic dysfunction. So it's a very impressive trial. Um, I think what it will mean to me in practice is I would attempt, in people with heart failure, I would, I would attempt sinus rhythm. And I think the best you can do is to see how they do. So now, one, so one piece of data that's really fascinated me uh, is a German study where they created atrial fibrillation in animals. And simply the irregularity itself, not the rapid rate, but just the irregularity, elicited a neurohormonal reaction with angiotensin II and... Um, with angiotensin II going up. So, you know, that may be one of the explanations. Uh, the other thing is that atrial fibrillation in the animal interferes with excitation, contraction, coupling, and calcium handling, and, and that is intimately linked to heart failure. 
So getting back to the, the risk stratification, we've spent probably the past decade or more really focusing on who we don't need to anticoagulate. Um, and, and I think that's um, in some ways a very patient-centric thing because patients yeah. really don't want to take yeah. a blood thinner. But if, if we look at Aristotle and Rocket um, and we look at the patients who are getting high quality anticoagulation, um, the residual risk in some of the higher CHADS-VAS patients is quite, quite substantial, five, six, seven percent. How do we start to attack the problem of residual risk? Uh, if there was a young investigator um, or fellow who came to you and said, this is something I'm interested in, how would you counsel them and advise them? Um, I'd tell them, why don't you submit a grant? Because we don't have the answers. Now, this will be very interesting, again, from the standpoint of the biomarkers. But the problem is, if you identify someone who still has a significant residual risk, what are you going to do about it? If they're on anticoagulants, they're on anticoagulants. Um, are you going to add left atrial appendage ablation? I don't know. I just don't know. Um, I think it's back to some of the heterogeneity you identified, and yeah. how do we figure out where the yeah. residual risk and, and you know, this is where I do think, I mean, I was probably being a little bit simplistic when I said that imaging, uh, CT scans, atrial appendage, um, morphology, left atrial fibrosis, if we can measure it, and biomarkers, um, I, I think this is investigational. I mean, this would be, this would be the group to look at. I mean, a group of patients who have recurrent events. Uh, right now, I think the other problem, as I think of it, is I'm shocked by the compliance data. Absolutely shattered by it. Because on one hand, you know, we really have a problem. Um, some of you may have been at the think tank that um, uh, Chris Granger and I chaired um, in Washington last year, and Sean Pacorni's just produced the manuscript which we reviewed yesterday and you know probably 40 percent of people uh, who should be on oral anticoagulants are not even getting them and you know the orbit registry data which you lead John is is a very d different patient population these are people who are getting anticoagulants because they come out of anticoagulant clinics and electrophysiology clinics and so on so the rate of use of anticoagulation is much higher but in the community at large it is, it is really disappointing. And now, and the whole think tank was, how, do we, how can we increase the utilization of oral anticoagulants? And now on top of that, I look and I see these data that they're not even fill, filling prescriptions. So you wonder how many of those current episodes are secondary to non-compliance, not in the trial. The tr trial is still a special world. And you know, even in the trials, there was a recurrence rate. So speaking of uh, orbit, so um, Emily's done a lot of fantastic work focusing on patient understanding and patient education. I I'm, I'm curious, given the, the clinical prestige of the Mayo Clinic, how do you guys approach atrial fibrillation yeah, this, is, this is really, you know, it's a really great question. Uh, some of you who do outcomes research may have come across Victor Montori, one of my colleagues. Uh, he has a grant right now with an unbelievable percentile ranking. I think it was four, four or five percent. And the whole grant is on shared decision making. And here's the problem. I'm actually a co-investigator on it. And the problem I find, uh, I mean, I'm actually surprised that it got that kind of a, a ranking. I mean, they, everybody's really interested in it. But you say, well, how do we approach it? I, I've just said, you bring a nurse or a coordinator into the room, talk to the patient, and you can go on all afternoon if you want. But I can't, because I've got other patients to see. And it's so time consuming. And so I think if we really are going to go ahead with shared decision making, which is, in theory, it's very attractive. I mean, it's the right thing to do. And I do find, personally, that very few patients that I recommend should go on to an oral anticoagulant, very few refuse. I mean, when I start talking to them about the strokes and, you know, AFib strokes or bad strokes, th they'll take it. I mean, you get the odd one who won't say, well, it's up to you, you know. But I think that the, 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 the information sharing and the shared decision making 
in theory is a very good idea, but it's going to be a challenge to implement. And what we are really saying to our administrators, we're happy to do this. You better provide the ancillary help that you know, healthcare personnel, because we can't do it. I mean, there is no way that we can do it with our clinical load and everybody I know here, everybody is getting higher and higher clinical loads. And I can tell you that when, at, in general at Mayo in our subspecialty clinics, so I do a valve clinic, a heart rhythm clinic with a lot of AFib, a Hokum clinic, we're allowed um, uh, an hour for each new patient. So we'll see eight patients in a day of which two will be returns. So even allowing for an hour for a new patient, that you still can't do that and shared decision making. Are you guys hiring right now? Um, uh, I don't. They, they, begin to, they, they begin to say that there are too many cardiologists. I'm getting worried because I've got a contract. Um, but that's for the new patient. And, and you know, you, we've all seen this. You, know, you show them a smiley face and a non-smiley face. It's, it's like, I don't know if you go through... Um, Security. You, mean you come in the room, and then Doug Packer comes in after. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've seen the security at Heathrow Airport. Right? I might add, I've met more of my uh, colleagues and friends at Duke in the lounge at Heathrow Airport than I have anywhere else. But if you go out of security, it says there, "Please press the following button." You know, did you have a good time? Smiley face. Did you have a bad time? <laughs> and I think that's shared decision making. <laughs> well. Um, there's a couple of interventionalists uh, in, the, in the crowd, um, and uh, you know this is something that comes up in AFib clinic a lot, which is challenging because yeah. the, the heart rhythm provider isn't always the coronary yeah. artery disease provider. Yeah. Again, I picked the wrong ESC to miss. I mean, redual PCI showing, again, perhaps that dual therapy uh, over the long run uh, carries lower risk for the patient. Do you think triple therapy is dead for our patients with PCI? Yeah, I think, I, think, I think it's going that direction. But uh, right now, I, I think it's a little bit depends on whether it's Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Uh, I, don't think, I don't know any field right now that is changing as rapidly as this issue of, 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 of dual versus triple therapy. I wasn't that impressed with redual PCI. Um, first of all, if you looked at the dose of the bigger trend that we have in this country, 150, the bleeding rate wasn't that much less. I think it was 25% versus 20% or something like that. And if you looked at the lower dose of the bigger trend, I think there was a trend towards a slightly higher rate of thromboembolism. I'd have to go back and look at redual PCI. I didn't find that the the results were that striking. But I do think, and we're in, I'm involved with the ESC guidelines on stable angina, and we are wrestling with it right now. What are we going to recommend in people who've had PCI and have atrial fibrillation? I think we can say a couple of things. The bleeding rate with triple therapy is extremely high. Aspirin is the culprit. And I think we will we will see aspirin off the map. And the question will then be, is it going to be, uh, you know, um, clopidogrel, uh, ticagrelor, plus one of the low-dose NOACs? I think aspirin will go. And what I'm doing in practice, I think, is common sense, and that is I'd start off with triple therapy. I tell patients that Keep, stay tuned, because we may give you a different story in six months, because we really may. And then um, if, if they come back at six months and there's no bleeding and, every, and they tolerate anything, I keep them on it. And uh, then if they get out to a year, that's the DAP trial of, you know, dual versus single, and we, we sort of talk along those lines. It's really a changing world, but I, I think that with the newer newer generation of stents, we can probably shorten the duration of triple therapy. And maybe it will go away. Um, speaking of bleeding, let me sneak one more question under the wire here. So uh, I agree with you. I think bleeding scores are, um, are kind of a distractor when we're trying to decide yeah. about oral anticoagulation. But for me, one thing that seemed that the change that is the availability of the occlusion devices. Right. And so maybe there are some patients who have such high risk of bleeding that the lower efficacy 
of an occlusion device versus an anticoagulant makes sense for that patient, or maybe just certain phenotypes. Do you think the bleeding scores may be useful there? I don't, I don't really think so. I, I think that, um, look, I, I, I give a qualifier. Um, Mayo has intellectual, we did have intellectual property in the Watchman. Uh, and David Holmes, um, my friend and colleague, uh, was very involved. Uh, for some reason, unbeknownst to me, Mayo basically gave that technology to Boston Scientific. But we still have, you know, an int intellectual interest, put it that way. Um, I'm very worried about the Watchman data. It's only 500 patients. There's a very steep learning curve. Um, when you get out into the community and people are putting, and uh, the watchman is okay, but the lariat is a pretty barbaric device, I think, with a very high uh, complication rate. And what bothers me about the occlusion device, I probably refer two or three patients, two patients a month for that. I see a lot. I'm not using the bleeding school. I mean, these are people, they've got, you know, um, on Villebrands, they've, um, They've got angiodysplasia. I mean, they're bleeding. Uh, the last one I saw was a patient with profound orthostatic hypotension. And every time he fell, he was really hurting himself. And it was actually a very complex decision because he did have amyloid, and the question was, what is his life expectancy, and you know, what do we gain from it? So these are people that don't need a bleeding school, really. They're bleeding. And I don't think I would put a watchman in to someone because of a perceived risk of bleeding, they've got to have bled. Uh, so I won't use the score. But I do, we, we, do use, um, we do use the device. Um, I've, I still, what really disturbs me, I don't know how many of you go to TCT, you know, the interventional meeting. It's incredible to see how the device is presented. The talk, and even David, tongue-in-cheek, does this a little bit. I mean, he gives an incredibly funny talk, but it is an absolute destruction of warfarin. So it's not, wait a minute, we've got something for those people who can't tolerate oral anticoagulants. It is, we, oral anticoagulants are bad news, and we have something. And that's not the, that's not what it's about. And I, I heard, I've, I've heard a number like that where they, all they do is dwell on the fact that people don't take warfarin, and then he says, you know, it depends on whether you are the bleeder or the bleedy. I mean, it's a hell of a funny talk, but, but it's intellectually, it's horrible. So, but I think there's a role for it, of course. Uh, there is a role. But to answer your question, I wouldn't use the bleeding score as the arbiter. I'd want to see them bleed. Oh, I don't want to see them bleed, but I mean, if I they do bleed. <laughs> Of course. Karen. I know it's coming. <laughs> well, you know what I want you to do if, if, with Garfield. I want, I, want, I want to see all of these CHAD scores calibrated in a way that you have the stroke rate for the population. And Garfield could do that. So my question, though, is um, for, for those patients, there's a lot there in these registries, we see that there are a lot of patients who have a CHAD score of zero, CHADS VASC of zero, and yet they're being treated. So is, do you feel like this is that um, the doctors are seeing uh, factors in these patients that are not being collected in these case report forms for the registries for the, uh, for, uh, and, and so forth? Or is it that the doctors are just not appropriately treating the patients? I, I think it's, the, I really do think it's the latter. And, um, you know, um, I think Magnus Oman has shown it in the Crusade Registry. The less sick the patient, the more we do to them. I mean, more people in the Crusade Unstable Angina Registry, I think uh, those with, um, at lowest risk, had the highest incidence of angiography. And I think this is, I think we've seen people inappropriately treated. And what made, makes me think of it is I think a paper, I think we just published it in Jack. In fact, I better just check whether it's changed my H index. <laughs> no, it hasn't, because it only came out about a month ago. Uh, 
But we looked at people in Optum who were inappropriately dosed with no X. It's a complicated paper, and I, I need to look at it again. But it was all over the place. Uh, I mean, the reasons for underdosing were just uh, incomprehensible. So I, you know, you'd like to think uh, with a Pixaban, we 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 have a dosing scheme for people with renal dysfunction and uh, older age and so on, so on. It, it, it was all over the place, and uh, uh, makes me think it's just inappropriate, and it's, you know the guidelines are not being followed. And uh, I've I've seen um, uh, we don't see many people in Dabigatran in our area, but when I when we did, I, I was seeing they were all on seventy five BID, which you know is a dose for people with severe renal dysfunction that was developed by the FDA based upon a pharmacodynamic model. We don't even have any data. And then I've seen it in, in people with mechanical valves. So my guess, Karen, would be that it's inappropriate. I mean, I think if you're a Chad's Vasque of zero, um, you, know, uh, you shouldn't be an anticoagulant. And I, I've often wondered, uh, you, you've seen some of the data that's just been published, like the Reveal AF trial. So I was involved with that trial. I think 30% of people with a Chad's Vasque of two developed atrial fibrillation over the next two years if they had an implantable loop recorder. Well, how do we translate that clinically? And I actually thought of it in personal terms because I'd be a Chad's Vasque of two. And I don't want to go on anticoagulants. I live, I live in a ski resort. A lot of trees there. I ski with Granger. This is this is this 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 changes the bleeding we score. We have a lot of behavioral counseling. This, this is the, the changes the bleeding score. So I thought, you know, would I go into an anticoagulant because a trial tells me that if you put in a loop recorder, I may get atrial fibrillation. And no, so it's a problem. I don't think you, with a zero, I think you should not be, particularly if you're really active, biking. You know. Well, thanks so much for your time today, and thanks for sharing your wisdom with us. It's always Pleasure, great to John. have you here. Pleasure. Thanks. Thanks again to Dr. Pacini and Dr. Nice Kirsch for, for their fascinating talk today. I did want to remind everyone, we have a really wonderful session next week on leveraging the electronic health record for a global mega, mega trial. Um, it's going to be given by two faculty in population health sciences, Sue Raman and Brad Hamill. So I encourage you to join us next Tuesday at noon. Thanks.